From the nation's capital, the American Enterprise Institute for Public Policy Research presents Public Policy Forums, a series of programs featuring the nation's top authorities presenting their differing views on the vital issues which confront us. Today's topic, should U.S. immigration policy be changed? Is there a limit to how many immigrants this country can absorb without affecting American jobs, the economy, and spending on federal services? If immigration is to be restricted, where do we draw the line? Who won't be allowed in? Should we spend a fortune and stop illegal immigrants, or just admit we can't stop them and grant amnesty? Welcome to another Public Policy Forum presented by AEI, the American Enterprise Institute, a nonprofit, nonpartisan research and education organization. Taking part in today's panel are Harrison Schmidt, who is a Republican senator from New Mexico. Senator Schmidt is a co-sponsor of a bill to grant temporary visas to migrant Mexican workers. He is a member of the Senate Appropriations Committee and the Senate Small Business Committee. Lawrence Fuchs is chairman of the American Studies Department at Brandeis University in Massachusetts. Dr. Fuchs is on leave from that position, serving as director of the Select Commission on Immigration and Refugee Policy. He is a recognized expert on ethnic and religious factors in American life. J.F. Otero is International Vice President of the Brotherhood of Railway, Airline, and Steamship Clerks. Mr. Otero, who came to this country from Cuba at the age of 20, once served as the International Transport Workers Union's Director for Latin America. Michael Novak, who is a resident scholar at AEI, is the author of a syndicated newspaper column which often analyzes problems of ethnics in U.S. society. He is the author of the book, The Rise of the Unmeltable Ethnics. John Charles Daly will moderate the discussion. Mr. Daly has served as a top news executive, analyst, and correspondent for CBS and ABC, and is a former head of the Voice of America. Now, here is Mr. Daly. This public policy forum, part of a series presented by the American Enterprise Institute, is concerned with a major social problem brought anew to confrontation by the cataclysms in Southeast Asia, the tides of immigration crisscrossing the Mexican-American border, the upheavals in the Caribbean in the 60s and the 70s, and the tragic emigrations from Cuba and Haiti in the early months of the 80s. Our subject, should U.S. immigration policy be changed? Our nation's record on welcoming the tired, the poor, the huddled masses yearning to breathe free, the wretched refuse of the teeming shore, the homeless, the tempest-tossed, is spotty, but it is still very proud. It was a century after the Declaration of Independence in 1875 that the U.S. first restricted immigrants, barring convicts and prostitutes. In 1881, 1908, and 1917, the Congress acted against Chinese, Japanese, and Asian Indians in that order. In 1921, quotas were established based on national origin, a system locked in by the McCarran-Walter Act of 1952 and transparently biased to keep a lid on immigration and to give overwhelming priority to those of Anglo-Saxon and Nordic origins. Several bills watered down the McCarran-Walter Act during the 50s and the early 60s, and in the end, after long and biting debate, the savage dislocation and a horde of displaced persons following upon World War II brought basic reforms in 1965. To replace quotas and Asian exclusion, preference based on unification of families and occupational skills with protection of the job market for Americans became the benchmarks. The new legislation also placed ceilings of 170,000 for the Eastern Hemisphere with a maximum of 20,000 per country against an overall ceiling of 120,000 a year for the Western Hemisphere. 17,000 places were reserved for refugees. Signing that new legislation in 1965 at the base of the Statue of Liberty, President Lyndon Johnson said, it repairs a deep and painful flaw in the fabric of American justice. The days of unlimited immigration are past, but those who come will come because of what they are, 
not because of the land from which they sprung. The reforms begun in 1965 were virtually completed in 1978. Legislation combined the two hemisphere ceilings into a single worldwide total of 290 and established a uniform preference system. The 70s, however, produced new and agonizing problems that a patchwork of parole power and special legislation did little to solve. Under the hammer blows of that turbulent decade, it became clear that reserving 17,000 places for refugees was unrealistic. In the past quarter of a century, in fact, attorney generals alone have used that office's discretion and its powers, its parolee power, to admit more than a million refugees from Hungary, Cuba, the Soviet Union, and other countries. And the Refugee Act of 1980 gives the president complete discretion on the admission of political exiles. And so in the fall of 1978, a select commission on immigration and refugee policy was established by the Congress. To begin, gentlemen, I would pose the same question to each of you in turn. What would constitute a humane and proper policy for immigration into the United States? As executive director of the Hesburgh Commission examining present policy, will you start, Dr. Fuchs? Well, I suppose a humane policy would be one that would add to the sum of humanity, of decency in the world and in this country particularly. We in the United States of America are responsible for 40% of the world's GNP, yet I don't suppose it's realistic that we could uh, take in over a short period of time 40% of the world's population. Knowing that there have to be some limits and that the number of uh, places available are going to be smaller than what the demand is, the question becomes how do we determine how to allocate those scarce visas to the United <coughs> States. I suppose we can think of a humane policy as one which meets our goals if we have confidence in this country, and I do. I believe that if the, the fundamental values of the nation, the fundamental goals of this country as set forth in our great documents, in our historic utterances by Jefferson and Lincoln and Franklin Roosevelt and others, if, uh, if they are to be uh, fulfilled and met, uh, through an immigration policy, we ought to look carefully at goals which manifest our national interests. That means something of a shift away from the kind of hodgepodge development that we've had in the past to a clear articulation of national interest goals. And I think that's the course that the Commission has set for itself. I I'll say more about that later, I'm sure. Right. Senator Schmidt? John, I think, first of all, more and more and more importantly uh, we have begun to separate political immigration from economic migration a very important distinction that any any new humane or workable policy must uh, have in political immigration i hope that whatever we develop and the commission recommends and the congress eventually modifies as its wisdom will recognize that political immigration has been the basis of a great deal of what this country is and that we should not do anything that, that eliminates that rejuvenation process in our own country, in our own heritage. In the case of economic uh, migration, particularly that from uh, Mexico and maybe other parts of Latin America, again, I think we have to recognize it is largely a true migration and that most uh, such individuals who come to this country for economic betterment uh, are temporary in their migration and desire to remain Mexicans or other nationalities and not become Americans. And as long as our policies will recognize those two things, that it's a political immigration and an economic migration, and in the latter case, develop a temporary worker visa program or some way in which that can happen legally, I think we will have a humane and workable policy. Dr. Novak. I do think, though, um, picking up on these remarks, that we're likely to see in the future uh, an increase in the number of those who seek to come to countries like the United States, and we better be ready for that. My reason for saying that is, is that uh, there is among human beings everywhere a hunger for freedom. And freedom is in short supply in the world. And it seems to me, looking at the future, that the number of societies which will permit liberty, uh, economic liberty as well as uh, uh, political liberty, uh, is likely to shrink. Uh, and in that case, we can expect more and more persons uh, over the years to migrate toward those few centers of freedom which will remain. 
Now, by freedom here, I want to be clear about the fact that I mean not just the seeking of opportunity in, by which one might better oneself. Now, that's very important, uh, of course. But there is also, I think, uh, other things being equal, a sheer satisfaction in living in the sort of society which allows you to keep what you earn, to spend it as you will, and all those other sorts of uh, freedoms which we come to have. Uh, some population specialists have suggested that uh, two-thirds of all the people who have ever lived uh, are alive now. If that's not the right figure, it's something very close to that. That, too, I think, suggests that we're going to have a very special problem in the United States uh, down the road. Given our past history with the question, I would say that in order to have a humane policy, we should err on the side of generosity. Mr. Otero. Mr. Daly. I support a policy for the United States that is consistent with our nation's traditions of humane and compassionate people. As an immigrant myself, a very proud American citizen, I sincerely hope and I will work for that America will remain the land of the free and the home of the brave and that we will continue to remain a nation of immigrants. I believe that an immigration policy that is humane should foster family reunification, above all. It should also provide a haven for those who seek uh, refuge from political persecution. And that is a policy that takes into consideration the interests and the needs of American workers. Also, I sincerely hope that uh, any type of a policy that is developed takes into consideration the question of dealing fairly and, or, and equitably with the problem of both legal and illegal immigration into the country. Well, as you've noted, the immigration issue is now really two issues. What to do about the admission of legal immigrants in the future, what to do about so-called illegals here in uncertain numbers of millions and, and still coming. So let's look at the legal issue first. The Hesburgh Commission's goal, in, in Father Hesburgh's words, doctor, is to design a policy that will be generous, humane, non-racist, rational, and workable. Does present policy fail in, in these areas substantially? Well, it's, it's not workable. It's out of control. And there's a, there's a uh, very strong sense running in, uh, in public opinion right now that it is out of control. That has to do partly with illegal immigration. The law is not enforceable and uh, you have substantial number of persons who enter without inspection, without documents, and live in an underground uh, economy to some extent and become an underclass to some degree. They are exploited not only at the workplace in some places, cases at the margin, but also are preyed upon by criminals. In some cases, they don't report their health problems and they don't report, e they don't even send children to school in some cases, which is a very bad thing for the United States of America. So it's not working in that respect. It's not working in another respect. The backlogs that uh, we have accrued over a period of time are really quite enormous. And in fact, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's gotten to the point where we now have in fifth preference, the preference for brothers and sisters of US citizens, such explosive growth that it can double every, every year. It did double between 78 and 79 from 230,000 to over half a million, Th those just who have been awarded visa numbers but can't get into the country because the backlogs are so great. So it's not clear that it's workable. It's not necessarily humane or equitable either because you have a rigid system, a rigidity in the, in the uh, immigration law uh, in which a, a person who is a spouse, a, a wife or a husband or a small child of a, of a resident alien uh, has to wait sometimes three, four, five or more years depending upon what country they happen to be petitioning from whereas a specialty cook might get in from another country just like that because of our country sealing system, which is a rigid uh, system. It puts the same country sealing on a small country like Liechtenstein uh, as we have on a large country such as India. So it's, it's not workable. It's, it's, it's not equitable. Uh, and uh, Father Hesburgh has these other, other qualities, generosity. Uh, one, it all depends what you mean by generosity. Now, if you take let's say the decade 1900 to 1910. At that time, that decade, we averaged about 900,000 immigrants a year. Uh, we averaged about 400,000 a year in the decade of the 1970s. That constitutes less than 20% of our present population growth at a time when we're growing at less than 1% a year. Now, it depends whether you're looking at 
the donut or the hole, if you mm -hmm. want to call, characterize that as generous. Well, compared to most countries of the world, it's quite generous. Compared to the decade 1900 to 1910 in the United States of America, it's not particularly generous. Uh, so there it is. Now, on the issue of humanity, uh, what I think the commissioners have, have fairly well decided at this point is that there are th three clear immigration goals. One is, as Commissioner Otero said a moment ago, one is the reunification of families. But we need to clarify what we mean by the reunification of families and make the system work so that when we say we favor the immediate access to this country of the wives, the husbands, and the small children of persons who are here, that other people can't leap ahead of them. We also clearly in the Commission accept the view that the United States will remain, as, as Mr. Otero said, a refuge for persons who are, have a well-founded fear of persecution in the countries that they're, they're leaving. The question here is, how can you uh, deal with uh, expellees, such as we have seen from Cuba? Now, under, they don't necessarily qualify under the definition of a refugee. One wants to be generous, but one wants to be equitable. One wants to have a law that's enforceable. Then there's a third goal that the Commission has seemed determined to meet, and that is to provide opportunity for persons who seek freedom and who seek opportunity of an economic kind. And here, Senator Schmidt, I think you've got an interesting distinction between the political immigrant and the economic migrant. The fact of the matter is it's not such a clear distinction historically, although the distinction, the distinction may be more clear in recent years. It's more clear in, now, in, in recent, I believe, in recent in, in, but you're correct historically. But in, in terms of our relationships with Mexico, the distinction has m maintained uh, fairly sharply through the, uh, through the decades and through the years. Well, one thing the Commission has under active consideration right now is whether or not the opportunity for economic well-being that so many people seek in the world and many come to the United States to seek it, whether or not that is not better provided by having them enter into the legal migration stream in a third category which meets U.S. goals for economic and cultural development rather than on a temporary worker or, or guest worker well, basis. But I, you mentioned earlier uh, that the process was out of control. It certainly, I think, can, for all intents and purposes, is out of, clo out of control in the political immigration area, but the, the economy of the marketplace is controlling the migration of the now what we call illegals, the migrants. Uh, there, I grow, I, of course, I'm from New Mexico, which sees a great deal of the flow, not all of the workers, but a great deal of the flow. And there's no question that these people are moving in response to, to the job market in this country. A small percentage of them are, in fact, competing with U.S. workers. But the recent research by both in Mexico and in this country indicate very strongly but that, that that level of competition is not nearly as high as it's been pictured by many. That most of the workers are moving across the border for the basic spring, summer, fall season to take those kinds of jobs that are characteristic of those seasons that Americans just aren't seeking. And it looks as if the number like 85 percent, plus or minus 5 percent, are of those kinds of people. It's always always dangerous to, to argue with the United States Senator, but no, it's the, never re dangerous. The, research, the research is so imperfect that uh, what, what we find in this business, Senator, is, is, is that uh, one can use research findings on either side of the argument. Many commissioners take the view that the United States should look into the possibilities of a guest worker program, which would be quite different than the old Bracero program. Yes, that, but, that would but, but other, other commissioners take the view, and each one of them can marshal their economists and their research findings, although, generally speaking, your, your, your statement that, if I understood it correctly, that the idea of severe economic competition or severe and widespread displacement has not been proven is, is correct. Neither has the as the well, as but the, at uh, least, as, as the uh, but at least the, 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 the what I, appears to be the most well grounded academic research, both in Mexico and here, uh, tends to support strongly the position that I have stated. There clearly has not been documentation that there is strong economic competition of this migrant. For one thing, uh, most of them are incapable in terms of skill levels of competing with American labor. Uh, n not to mention the fact that American labor doesn't have to fall below the safety net that we put uh, beneath them. Senator, is the, uh, is the 
proposal you make, the, the bill you have to do this sort of thing, is that pretty much designed for Mexico? That is, perhaps we should think of Mexico here as a special It is very specifically case. designed for Mexico uh, for a number of reasons. It's conceivable that, that modified, it can become a model for other, mm -hmm. other efforts. The Mexican problem is clearly one uh, that has certain unique characteristics, a 2,000-mile common border, for one mm -hmm. thing, uh, and the, the impossibility at any reasonable cost of policing that border, of stopping the flow, and the inhuman nature of the attempts to stop it, that at least so far have, have resulted in many cases. What do you history. propose to do? Basically propose to recognize that uh, the vast majority of these uh, migrants are coming uh, north uh, in response to an economic crisis in their own lives. Uh, they come and stay only for the period of six to eight months that uh, are normal working seasons for the semi-skilled, unskilled worker in this country and that uh, they then return to Mexico. And the evidence I find very persuasive that this is in fact happening. The numbers are somewhere on the order of a million and a half, plus or minus 500,000. That sounds like an awfully big plus or minus. But that one of the reasons we don't know the level of the problem is because it's illegal and you can't really get your arms around it and find out how big it is. Uh, we would add uh, one proviso in recognition of this significant but still small uh, percentage of uh, workers that compete with uh, American labor in the skilled areas, that if uh, under certain guidelines uh, it can be demonstrated that at a particular work site that American labor is available and willing to work, uh, and then uh, the, that site can be declared off limits to the visa holder. Mr. Otero. Yeah. Um, first of all, I'd like to say that I am <coughs> one of those commissioners on the Select Commission on Immigration and Refugee Policy who has made up his mind regarding the question of any attempt to, uh, by any description, to uh, institute another Bracero program in the United States. We are going to uh, oppose with everything that we have, I'm talking about organized labor, any such program, a Bracero program by any other name remains a Bracero Well, if program. I could interrupt, it would does you, not. Yeah, would you describe a Bracero program? Well, a Bracero program was something that was instituted in this country during the war days and uh, brought about the importations of 400,000 foreign nationals to do primarily work in the agricultural fields of the United States. It was discontinued in 1964, and there has not been a similar program since, although, although we have something called H2 program, which is uh, something on the more control. But what I want to say is well, that you have issued a series of statements, Senator, that I wish you could uh, furnish the Commission in terms of your research. The question that it doesn't affect American workers. It does affect American workers when you have a large pool of people in this country who are exploitable. There are in this nation today by all estimates, approximately six to eight million people unemployed. They don't go back. They remain here because they have no place to go back, like you say, escaping from a tragedy of uh, real economic difficulty at home. And they come to the United States looking for the job opportunities. And from this particular human tragedy, many American employers benefit by using these people in tremendously low levels of employment and at the greatest exploitation possible. All I wish is that you could do is go with me to New York City or to Los Angeles, California, and I'll find you these people working in sweatshops like the lights have not seen in this country since the 1920s. They're not working in the fields anymore. The six to eight million people are competing across the spectrum of American skills today. They are in railroads. They are in the hotel industry, they're in restaurants, they are in the garment industry, they're everywhere, and in very low numbers in the agricultural field. Well, <clears throat> the facts just don't support those kind of statements. Well, <laughs> there clearly are uh, illegal migrants from Mexico in the kind of jobs that you describe. I've not argued that, but the vast majority of them, by modern research, are in the agricultural area and in small businesses that otherwise would not be employing anybody. Uh, and the basic problem no longer uh, is one of, of can I get, as an employer, get a low wage scale person. The problem is can I get anybody to do that job? Now that's why we built into this proposed legislation a way of protecting the skilled labor of America. 
the unskilled, uh, semi-skilled uh, workers are, are finding jobs that are not being taken uh, by Americans. And uh, I think we have to recognize that fact. I think we also have to recognize that as long as they're illegal, the exploitation that you decry, and I do also, is going to continue. The only time that that exploitation is going to cease is when they have a legal status that, that they're not afraid of coming forward and saying, I'm being exploited. Why not, well, why Senator, not go that's all why. the way and give them a green yeah. card? And Senator, give them a Senator, this illegal. is what I am Because they don't want a green card. Why not? What's they, the they want to move back and forth across yeah. their border. They're Mexican. Well, well, a green card doesn't keep you from... You mean the H-2 card? No, no, I'm sorry. No, a resident, no, no, a resident, a resident alien, alien, an immigrant. Most, most immigrants who come to the United States historically really come to look around. And even with some groups, uh, of course, the return migration, the repatri repatriation was really very significant. Historically, about 30 percent of the people who immigrated to the United States went back to where they came from. Some groups, Italians, Southern Italians, the rate was even much higher. And well, that, that was, appears to be about 90 percent in the case of the uh, Mexican moving across the well, border. No. Well, not, not for legal, All the evidence that anybody's placed evidence. in front of anybody says that's the number. There not has the, been not any contradictory evidence and that's, that I'm Senator, let the, I'm not going to debate you here today on issues that uh, you have your viewpoint and I have my viewpoint and the facts do not warrant that 90 percent of them go back. The fact of the matter remains that at a time when we have more than 10 million Americans unemployed in this country, we have got to adopt a policy which is consistent with the interests of American citizens at the same time remaining our borders open. Now, I couldn't agree with me, you more. And let me, that's let me finish exactly my point. the policy that we're proposing. Let me finish my point. The question is, I, I understand what you're trying to do, but I am also trying to explain to you that there is a reality which makes it almost impossible for the American worker to have a bargaining power when he is confronted with this large influx of low-wage, you know, exploitable people. And the reason is very simple. Take the state of Virginia, for example, where the tobacco growers get together and in a monopoly type of a situation, they set the rate for picking tobacco at $3.10 an hour. And since they are the only ones that set the rate, the Labor Department is unable to say, there should be any other rate. So an American worker that wants to pick tobacco has to pick it for $3.10. He has no bargaining power with that employer. So consequently, even if he lives far away from the point where the picking is going to be done, and he says, well, I need another 40 cents to pay for the high cost of gas or whatever, I will do it for 3.50. The Labor Department cannot certify but, that way. you see, that's exactly what well, we're trying to protect against in this bill. Well, okay, fine. But Where there is willing American labor, then they, the work site would be off limits. Well, what we then have to do... You have no such a means right now to declare that work site off limits. Yes, yes, we have. The problem is that we have to change the immigration laws to provide for a genuine availability test of American workers. As it is today, that doesn't exist. And naturally, a grower or an employer prefers to bring a group of people who are not wise about their rights in the United States, and it makes it impossible for them to but compete. But that's what we're trying to change, Mr. Otero. That's exactly what we're trying to change. We're trying to change the situation under which these workers are exploited. There's no question about it. And also protect the American worker in those situations exactly like you described, I don't where they're under this this unfair competition? I don't disagree with what you're trying to do. What I'm trying to tell you that they're the first thing that comes first. What we ought to do first in this country is to have amnesty across the board for all the people who are illegally in this country. Allow them to regularize their status. Wh what to does become that mean? What, is, what does amnesty mean? Does it mean five years we're going to defer well, it, any deportation? It depends. Or? I am against total uh, any type of mass deportation. I think this country cannot tolerate mass deportation. Now, whether we say one year or two years or three years, that's a question for the commission to decide in making a recommendation to Congress, and then it'd be up to you, well, of course, of the course, legislators, my to is. decide. Well, let but, me, let but, me bring a point me. in yeah, here, if I may. Don't we need now, some hard numbers on how many illegals they are? You hear everything from a few million to 12 millions. Okay to make any reasoned judgment on policy John, and how we're going them. to get it's them. Impossible. You can't That's it. How until we until you legalize them. it. The problem is, Mr. Daly, and for the, for the audience too, is that if you could count them, you could deport them. Uh, mm -hmm. you, you can't count them. 
with great the kind of the kind of accuracy precision that we would like there have been a great many ingenious studies which have tried to account them they all depend on heroic assumptions the methodologies can be quite ingenious now in the census bureau review for the select commission of all of the best of these studies the most credible ones it was de it was determined by the three authors of that review of that analysis that at any one time in the year 1979 there was no fewer than 3.5 million and no more than 6 million mm -hmm. and that's really what it amounts and, to. And that lower estimate jives, speaking all, only of the Mexican situation, with the estimates of, uh, of 1 to 2 million Mexicans. But that again the, is a heroic one assumption three. that you mm -hmm. know the percent. Senator, it was the, the, other, the other finding is that probably no more than half of the undocumented aliens in this country now uh, are Mexican nationals. Well, the, Duck, the, Cornelius the, and others would say 60%. Yeah. Is it all right to broaden it beyond Mexico for yes. a yeah. Yeah. Actually, I wish you would, because well, I think we mustn't freeze in on one geographic area. First of all, as a theologian, I find I don't have to worry too much about numbers beyond three persons in God, seven sacraments, a few basic uh, <laughs> little numbers make life a lot easier uh, for me. But it, it does seem to me that irrespective of our special historical relationship with Mexico and the Mexican people, uh, a naughty but I think a soluble problem, one soluble with uh, goodwill and intelligence. Uh, it seems to me we're going to be facing this tide of uh, refugees coming en masse suddenly from different parts of the world and we're going to have to gear up as a society in a way we haven't for a long time to think of ourselves again as a society of immigrants uh, suddenly besieged and we're going to have to I think mobilize our private sector, the churches, uh, uh, the universities, business communities, the unions and so forth to be ready to receive such migrants. I, I'm almost certain that the 80s are going to see one wave after another coming from God knows where, but Africa, Asia, uh, Latin America. The world is, is, is so turbulent, as one can see in prediction, that uh, we're, we're just going to have to gear ourselves up to be ready on a crash basis to receive as needs John, to be. I, I think Dr. Novak is ex entirely correct on this. And I would add only that at the same time we gear ourselves for that influx, uh, which is going to come at unpredicted times. We must also do those things out there in the rest of the world through a coherent foreign policy that perpetuates two things. One, freedom, and two, the economic development of these countries that begin to reduce those push factors that exist out there that cause such migration. And they go together. It doesn't mean the migration or immigration is going to disappear. It means that we have to be doing both things, and they're both eminently justifiable morally. Uh, Mr. Daly, I... Yes, Mr. Attorney. I'd like to say... Uh, that I don't disagree with your bill in its entirety. Uh, what I am saying is that we need to attack the problem at hand in a uh, combined uh, uh, effort. First of all, uh, we need to do various things to attack the problem, not just one single thing, like providing additional job opportunities for people and to make sure that they're not illegal in the country. We need to give amnesty in this nation. Uh, we need to curb the flow of illegal immigration into this country. And for that, we need to have uh, to put the problem in its proper perspective. And that is, people come here because of the push factor and the pull factor, meaning that people don't have a job at home, they come here looking for a job. We need to have sanctions on employers who knowingly hire illegal aliens. There should be criminal sanctions with injunctive relief. We should also have greater enforcement at the border. Uh, we should have enforcement of existing statutes, such as child labor laws, Fair Labor Standards Act. We need to provide economic assistance to other nations, such as Mexico and other countries in Latin America, to help them develop their own economies. Uh, we, help, we need to um, develop a number of other uh, areas to curb this problem and to bring it to manageable proportions. We will never be able to stop illegal immigration into the United States. That is an impossibility if we are to remain a nation that is a democratic bastion throughout the world. We cannot conceivably mobilize the Army or the uh, Air Force or any other f service to seal the border. That is impossible. But we can, if we put our minds to it, bring about enough measures to be able to remain a nation that admits people legally. Yes, I'm in favor of increasing the number of people who enter the United States legally. 
legal control migration. Yes, more refugees, but also taking into consideration that there are 14 million political refugees today in the world, and that it would seem impossible that America could take them all at the same time. This is something that should be internationalized. Other nations of the world that share the same responsibility with us, Australia, Western Europe, and so on, should also be participating in accepting the refugees. But we, in doing all this, we must always keep in mind that we have a responsibility to our own people, especially at a time when our economic situation is not the best, when we have large number of people unemployed, and the prospects for unemployment continue to grow higher. Those are the issues that should be taken into consideration in developing the humane policy that you were talking about. Well, let's come to grips with one area that you raised. Representative Peter Rodino in the early 70s proposed making it a crime for employers to hire illegals knowingly. Uh, the House reacted favorably, is my memory of it. The uh, Senate did not. Uh, the Senate act actively opposed the idea. Then in 1977, uh, President Carter renewed the Rodino plan and coupled it with amnesty for illegals here before 1970 and a temporary status for those who arrived after that until 1970, 1977. Now, Congress has not been enthusiastic, although the President has renewed this proposal. So what do you think of the plan, John, gentlemen? John, I would just have to say that the reason I got in, uh, involved in this, other than the interest that New Mexico has, uh, being very close to the border and culturally allied with Mexico, was the universal condemnation that the president's renewal of these proposals received. Sanctions, and, and it was condemnation by the Hispanic community, not just by everybody else, all of whom I think have a great deal of common sense, but it was primarily by the Hispanic community. Sanctions means discrimination. Every employer is going to have to be concerned about is that person who's approaching him for a job an illegal alien or is it a, is it a New Mexican that happens to look a little bit like a Mexican, like sometimes I do after a little bit in the sun. The enf and enforcement at the border is an impossibility unless you're willing to put billions of dollars into that. 2,000 miles. I'd like to take all of you along, just walk along portions of the New Mexico border. You just can't do it. It's an impossible task. And amnesty, I, I, I think there ought to be a, a clear set of criteria by which permanent residents would be granted for those people in this country. But the amnesty proposed by the president, some vague five-year plan, was again, deservedly, universally criticized. Dr. Fuchs? What I hear many of the commissioners asking is whether or not there isn't a way to meet your objectives, and what I understand your objectives to be as follows, to accommodate the, the desire of many employers in this country to find hardworking persons who will do an honest day's labor and so that they can meet their goals in their, wor in their establishments to accommodate the desire of a great many people, not just from Mexico, but from many countries in South America and Central America and other parts of the world, to come to the United States to, f to improve their lot economically, with the notion that they're not necessarily going to plant roots in the United States, not necessarily going to raise their families in the United States. And it, it seems to be what the commissioners are trying to do right now is to recognize that when you do have a large-scale temporary worker program, it isn't necessarily going to be enforceable, that there will be leakage out of that system, that human beings <coughs> stay here because they fall in love, they get married, they have children, or they find that they really do like the place, after all, and that in the nature of, of human activity, people don't really have that kind of a mindset, I am going back or I am going to stay. That's not the way most of our ancestors thought about it when they came. What there is is a kind of a concern that the whole thrust of our history has been away from indentured servants, away from bonded labor, away from slavery, toward treating every individual who works in the United States as a potential citizen, as a citizen with, as a poten as having the potential for all of the entitlements and all of the the rights protected by the Constitution. And our resident aliens all have that. So that's, that's some of the thinking. The, the, the fear that in the nature of the case, no matter how well designed, 
a temporary worker program might not meet the high standards which Americans oh, but, have but set think, for the protection of I think of, one of the of problems workers. that we're having is we still remember the word bracero, mm -hmm. which was a, a program that everybody would like to forget. It was a program that required a contract to exist between the worker and the employer. That's what is often forgotten in the descriptions of the Bracero program. And what we're saying is, no, let's do everything that you have just described, but ex except we are going to put a limit on the time that they can spend here, a temporary worker visa program. But otherwise, all, the ropes are off, and all U.S. laws apply to the protection of these workers, to their to their salary levels, to everything else, and the benefits <coughs> that they restrain. That is the difference. <coughs> <in> the <coughs> they could Leakage will occur. Before we get to, to uh, the question and answer session, there's, Mr. Otero raised a point which uh, I think would be useful if we could uh, define further or delineate on. Uh, Mr. Otero knows we have a, or should have, the help of other nations in this resolution of this, this uh, immigration problem, the refugee problem being a large part of it, because it's going to be with us as far as we can see into the future. So what kind of help can we expect or should we expect, for instance, from the United Nations or any other international body in this immigration crisis? Dr. Fuchs, you want to? Should and help are two different. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, should, should we expect and, and what kind uh, will we get are two different things. Of course, I think we should expect a great deal from many potentially large receiving countries, but we have received very little. I'm not sure how effective our efforts in this line have been. Uh, but what we have now are very thin, weak international structures to deal with an international problem. The international problem of, of migration is one of the great world issues, one of the great planetary issues of our time. We don't have planetary structures to deal with it. If you take the question of refugee migration and sudden refugee migration particularly, uh, we've, we followed up on the, the great Cambodian crisis with a marvelously dramatic episode. Vice President Mundale went and made a mar wonderful speech, talked about the turning away of the Jews in the 1930s and so on. And we were able to extract some cooperation from other receiving countries. With respect to this recent Cuban episode, uh, our uh, efforts on the diplomatic side, to the extent that they, we made them, don't seem to have borne much, much fruit. So when you say what kind should we expect, we should expect a great deal. This commission has under study now ways in which we might be able to build regional, that is on an international scale, uh, structures which could help to plan for and, and uh, deal with emergency refugee flows when they took place on a regional, on a regional basis. They don't exist right now. Uh, and uh, that's really the answer to the mm -hmm. question. Well, I, I think okay. the United States should take the initiative to promote some sort of a conference on a worldwide basis to develop ways and means for the handling of this type of crisis such as we have uh, witnessed in today. There's no reason why the nations of the free world that have a concern that they are with us in, uh, in military alliances, economic alliances, and so forth, should not get together and develop a statue internationally to try to work together in resettling these refugees all over the world. And uh, to me, uh, the United States should be taking that initiative because everybody in the world wants to come to this country, and I think we should be proud of that, that uh, we remain a nation. The people don't want to go to Russia or Red China. They want to come here. John, could, yes. could I interpose one thing? One point we have to remember here is where are these people coming from? One of the great causes of these migrations we're talking about is totalitarianism. And so long as we let totalitarianism multiply, which it has done in Cambodia, in Cuba, here, here. and in other places as well, that is where the ref tide of refugees is coming from and will come from. And until the free world nations are willing to face that problem, uh, there's going to be a, a, a greater shortage of liberty and more people coming Amen. here. Amen. Amen. Well, I think we've opened this general subject up very broadly. I think there's one quick question that I might pose. I have read and heard charges that in the differential treatment of the Cubans coming out of uh, Cuba now and the Haitians who are coming into to Florida, uh, we have a racist policy. Dr. Fuchs? Under the new law, the UN protocol has been accepted in the definition of refugee. And that's anybody who has a well-founded fear of persecution should they return to their homeland. The problem with the Haitians may, may be several fold. Apart from the racist factor, which I have really no, no personal knowledge of at all, there is the fact of, one, 
people who flee from persecution in Haiti, to the extent that there, there is real persecution and there is no question there is some, are fleeing from a family despotism, not an ideological desp despotism, and not fleeing religious persecution. It's not a question such as the Soviet Jews, where you know in, this, in the Soviet Union today, if you're Jewish, your kids are not going to have as good a chance to go to schools or to f fill certain occupations. So you have endemic, systemic persecution. <clears throat> but in the Haitians, it's a family. If you go along with the family, you're okay if you don't. So that's one problem. The second problem is the State Department, some time back when we had the old law, did send a team down to Haiti and looked the situation over and said that substantially what you have is, is people who live in terrible economic conditions, but that you don't have widespread political persecution. Uh -huh. So because of the legacy of that report, uh, and, and, and uh, because of the legacy of the law and the old definition, they, and perhaps because they are black, and I don't know that that's the case, but this is some of the thinking perhaps that's gone into mm -hmm. the reluctance of our government to move into a definition of uh, refugee status for the Haitian, even to grant work authorizations to those who are petitioning asylum for asylum. But the fact of the matter is that more recently the Cubans who have come to the United States also are largely seeking opportunity as the Haitians are. Some have a well-founded fear of persecution, particularly now that they have left the place, just as some of the Haitians have a well-founded fear of persecution now that they've left Haiti. But most human beings, it's again the human situation. Why do you leave? Why did the I Irish leave Ireland? You know, they were starving, but did they like the political system? Did they have reason to fear that system? Sure they did. And that it's a mixture of motives, and it's very hard to decide. Mm -hmm. Now, refugee policy and the last analysis anywhere in the world is going to be a function of foreign politics as well as domestic politics, as well as some generalized standard of equity, which we have tried to embody in the law. Mm -hmm. But it's, we can't accept all 14 million. One one, so we make decisions on an ad hoc basis. One problem you come to in the case of Haiti is the jump from, from defining a refugee as, a, as someone who flees from totalitarianism to defining it as someone who flees from authoritarianism. Mm -hmm. Now that covers virtually the whole world except a dozen or 20 nations at most. And that's an enormous jump. Now the, the difference between a totalitarian and an authoritarian regime is a considerable one because the one is able to cover a whole totality of human life. The other can be cruel and repressive, but without anything like the synchronization of controls. Uh, that's, I think, the, the, a step we're going to have to face. But if you're tortured, it doesn't yeah. matter. If you're the individual, if you're, that's if right. If you're the individual who's tortured. Right, we'll go to the question and answer right yeah, after just, Mr. Just Carroll. this point here. You know, the technicality that is applied to the Haitian refugees doesn't convince me in any way because Haiti has one of the most repressive, one of the most brutal dictatorships that this earth has ever known. In Haiti, Papa Doc, when he becomes your enemy, and you do something against him, not only does he kill you, but he kills everybody who's a member of your family. They eradicate your roots in Haiti. You know, Batista in Cuba used to kill a lot of people, and Marcos Perez Jimenez, and Castro still killing people and imprisoning people. So for anybody to say that the Haitians are merely economic refugees, they ought to have their head examined, because in reality, they don't know what's happening in Haiti. There is as much political persecution in Haiti as there is in Cuba or as there is in Guatemala or any other country that has a dictatorship. I think what we really defined here is, it is the definition problem is a very difficult one. We'll have to work. Now it's time for question and answer session. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You, sir. Please, sir. My name is Roger Connor, and I'm the executive director of the Federation for American Immigration Reform. It's better known as FAIR. I've noted that each of the panelists has, in turn, advocated an increase in immigration of one kind or another. So my question is this. In 1977, the Distinguished Roper polling organization found that 75 percent of the American people believe that a level of immigration of 400,000 per year is excessive. And today, legal immigration is running at greater than 600,000 per year. So my question to each of the panelists and I regret that all the panelists agree on this score, and you don't have a dissenting view, but I'd ask each of the panelists, why is it they believe that the American people are wrong on this score? Well, as, as an elected representative of those people, let me say that I don't know what the number is, and, and you may not have been listening uh, carefully enough. I, when my opening remarks, I said, I think we have to come to some decisions, some goals, some uh, limits, if you will, 
that are consistent with the uh, traditional role that political immigration has played in our country. I don't know what those limits are. I don't know whether they're 400,000 or a million or 200,000 or what. I just think that we, it is almost impossible with our tradition, in fact, I think it is impossible with our tradition to completely close our doors to political immigration. On the other hand, with respect to the uh, economic migration, uh, I think you'll find that the surveys are very different, at least in the areas that are most significantly affected by, that, uh, by economic migration, such, such as that from Mexico. Uh, the idea of temporary worker visa programs is, has a fair amount of support. And uh, I, I, think, uh, I think we have to continue to draw this distinction. There is a very valid distinction between the two. I think the most important distinction, Mr. Connor, is, is the one between legal immigration and on the one hand, and illegal immigration and sudden refugee emergencies or flows, particularly when there are expellees, on the other. What we found at our public hearings and what we are finding in, our, in, the, in the effort to fine tune the analysis of public opinion is there, is there is growing anxiety, even outrage, over an immigration policy that is out of control. And that means that the hostility is directed against illegal immigration and the and also to some considerable and growing extent against the acceptance of large numbers of refugees who are who impact very suddenly in uh, in a particular locality uh, uh, so that we have found that the and the polls never ask these questions and don't make the distinction really uh, we have found that with respect to the family reunification uh, goal of immigration with respect to the goal of immigration to provide opportunity for persons who have uh, who seek opportunity and who would make a contribution to the United States that when you make those distinctions there isn't the uh, outrage and hostility most people still seem to feel feel rather strongly that this is a country whose strength to a very large degree comes from valid immigration legal immigration but they are very angry about illegal immigration and about sudden impacts from refugees, particularly when they're expellees, as in the case of recent Cuban migrations. Dr. Novak? Um, public opinion isn't always right, and it isn't always to be followed, because public opinion itself changes. It changes when the economic climate is different. It changes when leaders figure out a rational and intelligent policy and seek to persuade people to follow it. A lot would depend with public opinion and how you ask the question. If you asked uh, whether they would like to turn people back in the sea, uh, whether by their choice of limiting from 400,000 to 200,000, let's say, they would like to condemn such persons to lives in prison or whatever else, I think the American people might very well suggest that there are some other things they would rather see yield than that. And uh, in any case, that's the function of leadership, to determine what is a rational policy and then to try to persuade people democratically uh, that it is indeed a rational policy which they would support. Mr. Otero? Uh, Mr. Conrad, your figure of 400,000 is, ina is inaccurate. 600,000 is more in reality. Uh, when you consider the number of legal immigrants coming into the United States through the regular route, plus the number of refugees from Cambodia and so on, you got over 600,000 people. And I am very cognizant of the so-called backlash that is being affected today throughout the country and particularly among my own membership in the labor unions. But I want to say to you that my advocacy for a larger number of legal migrants is subordinated to our doing something about the legal immigration in the United States. So as far as I am concerned, the two things go hand in hand. We first control or try to control illegal immigration and then worry about the numbers for legal migrants, uh, migrants into the United States. Next question, please. Yes, sir. My name is Roy Morgan. I'm executive director of Zero Population Growth. Uh, given that the U.S. population is about 5% of the world's population, and given that we consume about 35% of the world's non-renewable resources, it seems to make sense that uh, U.S. immigration policy should be a part of a national U.S. population policy. Would you comment on that, please? Who'd like to start that one? Why don't you I'll, start it? All right, I'll, please, I'll Dr. I'll say Dr. a word about, well, first of all, the, there's something tricky about those figures that I'd like to call attention to. Um, many of the things we now call resources 
non-renewable resources at that, were not known to be resources. Uh, 50 years ago, some of them 100 years ago for others. Um, that's a very important datum. Uh, the same population of the United States uh, that you were speaking of, because of its liberty, because of its inventiveness, because of the character of the people who come here, uh, is also the source of the, of the discovery of a quite considerably larger share than 35 percent of those resources. Uh, and so I think overall, in my own view, would be that our preoccupation with the uh, zero population growth alone in the United States uh, is not the only way to go about setting a policy either for population or for immigration. On this question of linking immigration policy to population policy and resource use policy, we've heard from as many people uh, arguing that they are worried about a shortfall in population in this country as they are worrying on the other side. The, uh, the argument is that uh, given our present fertility rate of 1.8, that uh, we will have a serious uh, shortage or of persons in the working age population relative to those who are over 65 or over 70 or who are more dependent and uh, on, on those in the workforce. This applies, of course, obviously, the Social Security God system. God help us if we don't change that Social Security, Social Security system. system. <laughs> but it also applies uh, with respect to uh, uh, general levels of productivity and very great concern about uh, what, what American uh, economic vitality will be in 1990 and by the year 2000. This concludes another public policy forum presented by the American Enterprise Institute for Public Policy Research. On behalf of AEI, our hearty thanks to the distinguished and expert panelists, Dr. Michael Novak, Dr. Lawrence Fuchs, Senator Harrison Schmidt, and Mr. J. F. Otero, and our thanks also, also to our guests and experts in the audience for their participation. This public policy forum on U.S. immigration policy has brought you the views of four experts in the field. It was presented by AEI, the American Enterprise Institute. It is the aim of AEI to clarify issues of the day by presenting many viewpoints in the hope that by so doing, those who wish to learn about the decision-making process will benefit from such a free exchange of informed and enlightened opinion. I'm Peter Hackus in Washington. This public policy forum series is created and supplied to this station as a public service by the American Enterprise Institute, Washington, D.C. AEI is a nonprofit, nonpartisan, publicly supported research and education organization. For a transcript of this program, send $3.75 to the American Enterprise Institute, 1150 17th Street Northwest, Washington, D.C. 20036.